Das ist das große Ding, das wir stoßen werden. Alright, everybody. Um, our next speaker also needs no introduction. It's basically impossible to be and not come across his work. Um, he is the uh, author of the uh, bulletproof paper um, and has made uh, many contributions in uh, proof folding, um, which is also what he's going to be talking about today. He's also uh, an assistant professor at the NYU um, and the chief scientist of uh, Espresso Systems. So uh, with that, um, Benedict, please. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, please let me know if there's any audio issues or something, but it's good to, uh, to see you all, and uh, I wish I could have been there to teach, so unfortunately I couldn't make it in person, but still uh, very excited uh, to be part of this event. And yeah, I'll be talking about the recent development in IBC and folding schemes, and I'll also explain a little bit what these things are for uh, maybe people who haven't heard some are not completely up to date with the latest um, uh, work on it. And uh, this is uh, John work with a bunch of people uh, because I'll be talking about the multiple uh, papers. And yeah, I'll try to give some brief overviews of them and then uh, yeah, hopefully there's even some time for Q&A. Okay, so what is IBC, or incrementally variable uh, computation? So consider an iterative computation. So for example, I have some hash function and I want to hash it many times in a row. So it's like a hash of a hash of a hash of a hash. And this is actually useful for something called uh, a delay function um, or uh, a verifiable delay function. Or you, know, you can actually consider an incredibly general class of uh, computation namely a virtual machine. So a virtual machine um, takes its input sort of the current state of the computation and then uh, does some operations on them. So for example, the EVM takes its input the current state of the EVM and then feeds its input uh, a transaction and then outputs the new state um, and does this uh, uh, and uh, for sort of many, many steps. And the question in IVC is, what if we want to make this incremental computation verifiable? So what if I want to um, basically efficiently verify that the number that the computation has been executed correctly, and say it's a t-step computation, then ideally the, the time and the effort to verify this computation is much, much smaller than t, or, or the, in the bottom it's m. So m is the steps of the computation. And uh, we can also consider these non-deterministic computations. That just means that there's some additional helper information uh, that is fed into it. So, and you can actually, so I talk about this, these incremental computations, but it turns out that you can actually formulate any sort of uh, computation as an incremental computation. And this is because I can just write a virtual machine, and then I write my program as a program that runs on this virtual machine. So while there's sort of the specific use case of these incremental computations, if I have a proof system for an IBC proof system, then in fact I can just formulate any other computation that I care about as um, uh, uh, this sort of uh, IBC style computation. So the goal is to create a proof for it. Um, and how do we do this? Well, uh, yeah, and, and the idea is that I want to create a proof for it, and that there's actually multiple properties that I want. So I said that I want to have one small proof that the entire computation was correct. Well, what you could do is you could just unroll the computation, and then generate, at the end of it, generate one, basically one snark that uh, the, the, all the M steps of the computation are correct. The problem is, is that this is not incremental. It doesn't take advantage of this incremental property which is that, say I did my computation for m minus one steps, and then I want to do one more step in the computation. Uh, well, I don't want to redo the entire proof. Ideally, what I would have is that I have this proof uh, m minus pi m minus one, and then I do one more step of the computation, and in parallel, I can update the proof pi m. And ideally, also, the work that the prover does here is independent of the previous length of the computation. Ideally, it just has to remember this part here, and then um, 
it outputs the new state of the computation Zm and the new proof pi m. So <coughs> we, we formulate this sort of a little bit more from uh, um, more uh, we formulate this sort of with multiple properties. One of them is the completeness property, which says that given any state of the computation Zm minus one and pi m minus one, I can create a new proof. This is actually sort of a slightly different completeness property or a slightly more uh, interesting completeness property than we have usually, because what you note here is that we say, given any accepting proof pi minus one and input z minus one, we didn't say that the proof was honestly generated. So even if the proof was adversarially generated and the state was adversarially generated, as long as it's an accepting proof, an honest prover should be able to compute. And knowledge soundness is uh, sort of the usual definition, which means that given an accepted proof, I can um, extract witnesses that satisfy this computation. Um, and yeah, but then the other properties are these uh, efficiency properties, and I won't go through all of them, but essentially one of the core benefits is that because I can update the proof, I don't need to have a lot of memory. I only need to remember sort of the current state of the computation. It also helps with parallelism, and I can hand off, uh, you know, I can even hand off the computation between multiple trusted parties, because one party puts in sort of the first 10 steps, and then the next party does the next 10 steps, and uh, because the memory is small, um, it only basically, uh, the handing off can be done efficiently. So, how do I, now that we sort of hopefully are convinced that IBC is an interesting and useful uh, primitive, how do we construct it? Well, in the, in the past, this has been done through something called recursive snarks. Um, so recursive snarks, I won't go into the details, but the idea is basically that I prove that I knew the previous proof. So basically, given at this step, uh, I, the, uh, going from zi minus one to zi, I basically prove that the function was executed correctly. <coughs> and also, in addition, I prove that the pre previous proof was valid. So I build a circuit for it, and then I construct the proof, which gives me a new proof pi i. And I can continue to do this. This is why it's called recursive snarks, because the final snark basically proves that all the previous steps of the computation and all the previous snarks were valid. So the problem with this approach is that exactly uh, this box here, namely that I have to put the snark verifier inside of the circuit. And um, this is expensive, um, uh, especially say, like I use a pairing-friendly uh, snark, then I have to use cycles of pairing-friendly curves, and it's just like practically a very expensive operation. <coughs> so the big question was, can we construct um, IBC without snarks? And basically following an, an initial work called HALO, and there's been a long line of work now, or a very active line of work. It's actually not, I mean, time-wise it's not that long. It started in 2019, but there's been a very, very active line of work on so-called accumulation of folding proofs. And the idea is very simple. Say I had two proofs, and I could somehow combine them into one proof, um, and the, 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 I have a so-called accumulation verifier, which is able to check now that combining these two proofs into one proof <coughs> sorry, was done correctly. So what is the property of this? Well, the property is that if pi 1 and pi 2 are valid, then pi 3 should also be a valid proof, and if pi 1 or pi 3, if one of them is invalid, then pi 3 should also be invalid. That's the only property we need. And ideally, d combining these proofs is done, is very simple. Right? These are very, very, uh, ideally combining these proofs are very simple. And this can be che efficiently checked by this accumulation verifier. And um, uh, so the idea is to not check pi 1 and pi 2, but reduce it to checking 3. I'll talk sometimes about accumulation and folding. They're the same thing. Uh, really, it's two, two different terms that are used in literature, and it has nothing to do with something called a set accumulator. Um, that's, yeah, it's just a separate name. It's the accumulation of checking these proofs. <coughs> 
Okay, so how do I um, now build build uh, IBC from an accumulation? Well, let's talk a little bit more about what accumulation is. Well, the idea is basically that I have these uh, two proofs, or I can also think of them as as an instance and a witness to a relation, and I reduce them to one. And the accumulation prover does this reduction, and the accumulation verifier checks it. And then there's finally an accumulation decider, which takes in the final uh, proof and basically says uh, yes or no. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it turns out, and we'll see it a, a little bit in this talk, but I just want to give the big highlight is that we can construct really, really efficient uh, IBC from accumulation schemes. And there what happens is that the accumulation verifier becomes the recursive circuit. So instead of having to put the SNARK verifier into the recursive circuit, all I have to do is run this accumulation verifier in the recursive circuit. And that can be much simpler. And in particular, we can construct uh, schemes where the accumulation verifier, where we don't require adjusted setup, it's just secure from the discrete block assumption, um, and the accumulation verifier only does uh, you know, a very small number of operations can be formulated in something as small as like 10,000 constraints versus these pairing based groups are more on the order of like uh, hundreds of thousands of constraints, maybe even up to a million. Um, yeah, maybe more hundreds of thousands. Um, so, yeah, I want to, uh, I don't want to go into all the details here. Um, you know, you can, you have to read the papers, but sort of trust me that. All we care about now is the size of this accumulation verifier because that becomes part of the recursive circuit. So why is this, you know, I made this claim that the accumulation verifier uh, can be simple. Um, and I want to give you a little bit intuition for why this is so simple. So let's consider a, a very simple circuit which just as addition. So it just does, uh, you know, of course, this is not a very interesting circuit, but let's just consider all the addition gates inside of the circuit. So uh, I have basically the prover claims it knows some A, B, and C, such that AI plus BI is equal to CI. Well, I can formulate this. So what the prover can do is it can first commit to A, B, and C. So it commits to all of these vectors using a so-called homomorphic vector commitment. So the idea of this commitment is that it shrinks these long vectors into a single constant group element. And uh, then we want to check, basically given these vectors, that A plus B minus C is equal to zero. So this can be done over vectors. And uh, homomorphic means that given two commitments to two vectors, I can add the commitments in order to get, and so I could you know, say I have two of them, then I could get the, add them to get a uh, commitment to A plus uh, A prime. And in fact, this is exactly what we're, um, uh, so exactly what we're going to do. So say I want to prove now that, say now I have two of these things, so I have A, B, and C, and I have A prime, B prime, and C prime. And I want to prove that basically both of them are true. Well, what I can do is I basically take a random linear combination between these two vectors. So I, I take a random linear combination between these vectors. And uh, if both of them are zero, right, if both V of A, B, C is zero, and V of A prime, B prime, C prime is zero, then certainly any linear function of them should also be zero. So it turns out that all I have to do now is check this at a random point. And then uh, with, with high probability, basically checking it at a random point implies that uh, both of the original checks were zero. So the verifier here would send the challenge alpha, and then we just combine these commitments uh, into sort of A prime prime, B prime prime, C prime prime, using this random challenge. And the verifier can perform, so the prover does this over these vectors, and the verifier can perform the check using the homomorphic commitment. Um, so it does it on, using only one group operation or one operation on these homomorphic commitments, which are constant size, they're independent of the length of the vector n. And, and, and yeah, so that's the idea for sort of combining two proofs. So what we've done here is we take two proofs, uh, one you call A, B, C, and one A prime, B prime, C prime, and simply combine them into a new proof, A prime prime, B prime prime, C prime. 
So of course you might ask, well, like a circuit with only addition gates is not very interesting and there would have been other ways to do this. So what if I also have uh, multiplication gates? And I don't want to go into all of the details, but it turns out that even with multiplication gates, I can uh, basically run the same thing. Uh, then it just becomes a degree two equation um, and I have to cancel out basically one of the, the, the middle coefficients of this GB2 equation. But there's a simple protocol for doing this. Basically, the prover first commits to the middle coefficient, gets a challenge back, and then uh, it com can combine these commitments again using only a constant number of operations. Um, again, you know, this, this uh, skips some details, but hopefully you believe me that combining two proofs can be done easily by just uh, taking a homomorphic, uh, basically a random linear combination of them, uh, which I can do over the commitments. So uh, there were some limitations of prior works. Again, uh, they basically sort of, for example, Nova work um, relies on the R1CS constraint system, so you can only do multiplication and addition gates. Um, you know, th uh, there's also sort of some limitations on how to do circuit branching. So, for say I have an EVM and I want to run a different opcode at every step. So, I want to select what opcode to run. Uh, then, ideally, I don't have to pay the cost in, in the opcode. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are these were sort of limitations that were essential for ZK EVM applications. And then uh, in, in Protostar, we sort of generalized um, a lot of these, these folding schemes. We sort of gave a, gave a very general protocol uh, for how to construct them that was also efficient. So uh, there's basically the, the, the key highlights here are that we were able to build um, an IBC scheme that can support very uh, expressive gates. So for example, I can have high degree gates and the cost hardly increases in, in the degree of the gate. So what is a high degree gate? Well, a multiplication gate is a degree two gate, but I could also, for example, check that A cubed uh, times B uh, to the power of five plus A squared minus B, or something like this. I can check the higher degree equation. Um, and it turns out in Protostar that we're able to do this and the cost only minimally increases in the size of the gate. Um, and yeah, so the, the, uh, the sort of these, these proof systems have become incredibly good and efficient. And uh, in particular, one thing that is interesting is that the size of the recursive circuit is as low as one to three um, group elements. And I can really implement this in, in sort of uh, 10 to 20,000 uh, gates. Um, I want to, uh, let me skip forward actually, I want to in the last couple minutes um, go to sort of one new idea uh, which is called accumulation without homomorphism. So one key component of these accumulation schemes is that uh, these accumulation schemes rely on homomorphic vector commitments. So I have to add the um, uh, two commitments together, I have to do a random linear combination between these two commitments together. So the question was basically, is this really necessary? Or can we build an accumulation scheme without relying on these homomorphic commitments? And one reason why this is very interesting or an important challenge is because we don't know all the homomorphic uh, commitments that we know, and sort of all the natural ones, are based on the discrete blockers actually. Uh, and th that is broken by a uh, quantum computer. So basically, we want to build a post quantum, if we want to build a post quantum accumulation scheme, then uh, one of the interesting avenues is trying to build one uh, using basically that does not rely on homomorphism at all. There was also a concurrent work that basically constructed the accumulation from uh, lattices, so called lattice Vulcan. So, um, how do we do this? Well, the, the basic simple idea is that we spot check the homomorphism. So say I have three vectors, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically spot check these vectors at different locations. So spot checking I can do with, a, for example, a Merkle tree. So say these 
vectors are committed using a hash-based Merkle tree, then I could just say, okay, I'm going to check the homomorphism at position 100. So say this red thing here. And so I open these three vectors at these three positions, and then I check whether A100 plus B100 is equal to C100. And I can do this at multiple points. So what does this do? Well, the problem is uh, that say I uh, um, say that at many positions, so the problem is that, uh, let's talk about the positive first. Say this vector is not actually the homomorphism, and there is, you know, say some constant fraction, so say like half of the, like at half of the positions, say the right half, C is not actually equal to A plus B. Well, if it's in half of the position, then every query has a 50% chance of catching uh, catching this sort of non-homomorphism. Um, and I can then calculate how many queries I need to do in order to uh, catch the adversary uh, with uh, overwhelming probability. Well, the problem is, what if the adversary doesn't cheat at a constant uh, fraction of positions? What if it just checks at a single position? Well, then the problem is, oh, let's see this here, but say it just checks at this, uh, cheats at this one position. Well, then the probability of catching the adversary is actually still low, um, because it just needs to hope that at this one position the adversary is not checked, uh, caught. So the idea that we had is to use error correcting codes. So what we do is we essentially extend these errors um, using a linear error, uh, error correcting code. And uh, then what happens is that still, you know, there might be some positions uh, where we don't catch the homomorphism. But the idea is that basically, even though, you know, say there's here, there's this one position where the homomorphism doesn't hold, once we decode these vectors, then the homomorphism will hold. Um, so the homomorphism basically holds over the decoded messages, even though it, it basically, uh, and we can do this by showing that it mostly holds over the encoded messages. So uh, this is skipping a bunch of details. One thing that is one interesting challenge of this work is that basically the more checks I do, the more errors can be introduced in this, um, uh, in this final vectors. So uh, I can really construct sort of full accumulation where I go from one cohort to another, but I can do some. I can construct something called depth bounded accumulation, which means that I can do a few um, sort of say a constant number or uh, a constant number of accumulation steps. Um, so you might wonder, well, is this really this interesting, right? Like you, you told me sort of about incremental verifiable computation where I want to run the computation for millions of steps, but now I can only do it for, let's say, 10 steps. Well, it turns out it is interesting, and the reason is that we can use sort of an, an old paradigm, uh, which is to essentially not build a line. Instead of a line, we're going to build a tree. And um, we can show that sort of this depth-bounded uh, accumulation gives us depth-bounded PCD. And then, uh, so what we do is essentially that we build things up in, in the tree. And then it turns out the number of leaves in this tree is, so if I have a tree of depth D, then I can have basically um, uh, M to the D computation. So I say M is, uh, M is 10, or say M is even just 2, and the tree is of depth uh, 10 then I can have a thousand steps here, but I can also you know, make M is basically the arity of the tree. I can increase the arity of the tree to say 10, and then I have the depth 10, and then I can have a million steps uh, down here of the actual computation. And we give many uh, optimizations for that. So uh, that's sort of the, 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 the last slide. I want to talk about Sort of one final thing, which is that there's many interesting open, uh, many interesting research happening in the space. Um, so I just listed a, a few of them here, and there's also some interesting uh, open questions. Uh, some of which I'm, I'm uh, we're working on, and, and we think we have very promising solutions. So one of them is is that right now, essentially, the size of the vector is uh, that I'm accumulating is as long as the underlying computation. So in the final step, it says to only be run once, but it has to be run. The size of this uh, accumulator witness or decider is of size n. 
And it would be interesting if we can uh, reduce that to something like square root n or, or even smaller, or even log n. And uh, we think we have some interesting uh, ideas there. And then uh, the other one is, uh, that I ch is basically the problem that I showed you is that without homomorphism, so far I'm only able to do bounded depth calculation. And what if I could improve this to unbounded depth calculation? So ideally I want to have basically an unbounded depth uh, unbounded number of steps uh, in this, in this uh, in, by just using Merkle trees and error correcting codes, and we think there's some problems. So, yeah, that's um, uh, the talk. I think I just made it in time, but you know, maybe we have to have a few minutes for a couple questions. First of all, big applause. Do we have any questions? Yes. Hi, Benedict. Uh, great talk. Um, regarding the idea of like adding accumulators which are like smaller than the witness length, uh, you, you mm -hmm. talk about the open problem. Doesn't that like reduce to basically having a succinct argument uh, and then like? The original motivation was like avoiding having to have a full snark uh, step, and now I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a difference in formalism, but it seems to me that you're trying to go back into succinctness, or is there a difference that I can figure out? So that's a good question. So uh, um, uh, if I answer correctly, sort of, can I just uh, you know, isn't it as hard, or can I just sort of throw a snark on it at the end? Um, so the problem is if I and, and in fact, like uh, oftentimes in practice, this is exactly what's done. Like in Nova, sort of you run a snark in the end in order to make the final proof small. The problem is that I cannot continue from this. Right. One of the key properties of IDC is that given a proof, I can continue the computation. However, once I've snarkified sort of the last proof, I cannot continue the computation. And of course, like you know. Uh, and so the hope is that we can do something sort of much more uh, lightweight, um, where the size of the accumulator still gets smaller. And the advantages are, in particular, for distributed computations. So, say, you know, for example, say I want to do a massive distributed signature aggregation. So, like, say in Ethereum, there's a million validators, each of them wants to sign, and we somehow want to compress the signatures. Um, you know, one by one, or like we want to compress all of these signatures into one. And so ideally, you know, we would have many nodes around the world, each compress their signature part, and then forward it uh, up, up some sort of uh, tree until I get the final signature compression. The problem is if now we use some folding-based scheme or some accumulation-based scheme, then now these proofs get really large that they have to forward. So uh, can we compress those uh, such that you know the communication is much uh, is much smaller and still you know people can build up this this folding tree. I see. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I think we have time for one more quick question. If someone has one. Otherwise. Um, Thank you very much, Benedict. Um, if people have more questions, how can they how can they get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can you can email me at uh, I think my email is on my website, but it's bb is the two letters b and then at nyu.edu. Okay, perfect. Then again, big round of applause.